Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 16th Claire M. Fagan Distinguished Researcher event. I'm Terry Richmond, uh, a professor in the School of Nursing and the Associate Dean for Research and Innovation, and I'm thrilled to kick today's event off. So please join me in congratulating Deborah, Dr. Deborah Watkins Bruner, the 16th recipient of the Claire M. Fagan Distinguished Researcher Award. And of course, we are honored to have the namesake of this award, Dr. Claire Fagan, joining us today. Good afternoon, darling friends, colleagues, and family. It's such a joy to see you again, if not to be with you. But I think we have to pretend we are together, and I think we've been pretending it long enough to actually believe it. At any rate, it's wonderful to be here with you and to be here for the 16th Claire Fagan Research Award. It's a pleasure to know we're giving it to Dr. Deborah Bruner, who is one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent, cancer research nurses in the United States. You will hear a lot more about her from Dr. Martha Curley, who will do her introduction. Dr. Curley will present all the bells and whistles. And after we hear Dr. Bruner, I know it's going to be a very exciting afternoon for all of us. But I want to tell you something else, and that is all of you know, I think, or most of you know, that this has been a period of a lot of sorrow for me since I saw you last. And the reason I said welcome to friends, colleagues, and family is because you are my family, and you have shown it in every way possible during this period. I don't know what I would have done without you. I value you, I love you, and the best part of it all is knowing the love has returned. So it's marvelous to be with you. I wish we were closer, but we'll see you again soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the love you give me and that I give back to you. Oh, thank you, Claire. Claire, you are a national treasure. And joining us today for the special occasion for Deb is her husband, Samuel Bruner. Welcome, Sam her son, Jesse Bruner, and his partner, Ben Tenikoff, her special guest, Dr. Susan Brown, Chief Nurse Executive Officer of the City of Hope, a special guest, Ann O'Mara, former National Cancer Institute officer, retired. And I'd also like to thank the many friends and colleagues and collaborators in the audience who've come to help us recognize and celebrate Deb including people from Westchester University, where Deb got her bachelor's, Widener University, where she got her master's, and where Deb is an alumna. And we are thrilled to have you here. And a special welcome to many uh, guests in the audience from Emory University. Now I'd like to take a moment and just refresh your memory about Claire Fagan and the purpose and intent of the Claire M. Fagan Distinguished Researcher Award and Lecture. Claire has dedicated her career to nursing science, healthcare, educational administration, and health policy. This was award was established in honor of Claire, our third dean, and recognizes remarkable scientists who bring distinction to our profession and to our school through pioneering contributions to health and society. I'm going to, to recognize all the past recipients of the Claire M. Fagan Award. They include the first awardee, Mary Naylor, Barbara Medolf Cooper, Neville Strump, Loretta Sweet Jamat, Linda Aiken, Marilyn Summers, Jennifer Pinto Martin, Julie Fairman, Lois Evans, Barbara Riggle, Martha Curley, Afaf Melise, Perry Richmond, Janet Dietrich, and Kathy Bowles. What a cast of distinguished scientists. Um, that Deb is following to become the 16th honoree. These extraordinary scientists continue to advance nursing knowledge and translate science all over the world. To all of, the pen, to all of Penn Nursing, these individuals have been incredible role models 
And we are thrilled to have you with us today. And I'm sorry you can't stand up in a real life audience and be recognized. Now I'm going to introduce an important person to Deb who will take over the program. Dr. Martha Curley is the Ruth M. Colcutt Endowed Chair in Pediatric Nursing at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a professor of nursing in the School of Nursing. She also, of course, is the 11th Clara M. Fagan Distinguished Awardee. So I'm thrilled to hand the baton over to Martha to introduce Deb and enjoy, enjoy every moment of this special event. Martha, I hand off to you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. I assume everyone can hear me. Yes, well, we can hear you. You're thank good, Martha. You. Good, good. Uh, so good afternoon, and thank you so much for this opportunity to introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Deborah Walkins Brunner, as the 2021 recipient of our really wonderful um, player. Fagan uh, Distinguished Researcher Award. Claire just mentioned that I will do the introduction uh, for Deb, but if I was to read through her CV, we would be here all afternoon, and Janet, I promised her that we would only do five minutes, so I will do my best to abbreviate all of what uh, Deb has done and contributed uh, to uh, to allow her to be selected for this Distinguished Researcher Award. Uh, as indicated, Deb is not a stranger to us. Uh, she is a native Pennsylvanian. She earned her PhD in nursing here at Penn. She was on faculty with us from 2006 and 2011, where I got to meet Deb for the first time. Uh, Deb taught quantitative research methods in our doctoral program. And as the interim associate dean under FF Malise for research, she completely redesigned our pre and post award process. And that was no feat at all. It was huge. Um, Deb Brunner uh, is currently the senior vice president for research for the entire um, enterprise at Emory University. She holds the Robert W. Woodoff Chair in Nursing at Emory School of Nursing. Deb is an internationally renowned nurse scientist whose sustained contributions have fundamentally changed clinical practice for cancer patients with bone metastasis and for symptom management of several treatment-related symptoms, including sexual dysfunction in patients with pelvic tumors, gynecologic cancer, and prostate cancer. Her research has been foundational to the field. It's been incorporated into course curricula and has provided the highest level of evidence, grade one evidence for interprofessional practice of cancer patients. Deb has been unbelievably continuously funded for over 25 years. She's been awarded $110 million as a PI and close to 90 million as a COI from sponsors that include the National Institutes of Health, Department of Defense, the American Cancer Society, and the Oncology Nurses Society. For over a decade, she has been among the top 5% of all NIH-funded researchers worldwide. Deb has worked with the National Cancer Institute National Clinical Trials Network, serving as a PI for three national clinical trials, and as a co-I for an additional 11 clinical trials. Dr. Brunner's pioneering leadership has led to a paradigm shift in cancer outcomes from a focus on patient survival and toxicity to a focus on the quality of that patient survival and patient reported outcomes, giving voice to what it's like to survive cancer treatments. Her original and co-developed instruments for measuring quality of life endpoints are now incorporated into almost all phase three 
cancer clinical trials. Dean McCauley from Emory School of Nursing notes that Dr. Brunner has been a constant source of disruption in healthcare, and we do know Deb as a disruptor. Dr. Uh, McCauley says it, it's, it does not matter how deeply rooted or widely held an assumption might be. Deb will challenge long-seated authority if it means life will be better or treatment less painful for her patients. Her contributions to science have fundamentally, again, altered the way we conceive of cancer symptoms and of treatment outcomes. Our own Dr. Maglani noted that Dr. Brunner's work on decision-making preferences and utilities for cancer therapies and health disparities in recruitment to clinical trials have produced generalizable science to improve the care of all patients enrolled in clinical trials. Deb's stellar reputation has led to multiple high-level U.S. appointments that establish national policy. She was appointed by probably our best president in my lifetime, President Obama, to serve as a member of the NCI National Cancer Advisory Board, she was appointed by the director of the NCI to the Clinical Trials Advisory Committee, which is tasked with oversight of the National Clinical Trials Strategic Directions. For six years, she served as the inaugural co-chair of the NCI Symptom Management and Health-Related Quality of Life Committee, which is tasked with the review, approval, and prioritization of the nation's NCI's sponsored symptom management and quality of life clinical trials portfolio. The impact of Dr. Brunner has been simply outstanding. She has published over 200 peer-reviewed journal articles and books. Her papers have been published in all the high-impact leading journals, including the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, JAMA Oncology, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, and the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. Proner has broken many glass ceilings regarding gender and discipline. For example, she has been the only female scientist and the only nurse to serve on the executive committee of the NRG, which is a consortium of over 1,800 institutions in North America with a major focus on women's health. Paying it forward, Dean Sullivan Marks from NYU notes that Deb continuously multiplies her impact by infusing imagination and confidence in many generations of novice researchers. Deb is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing, she has also uh, been awarded and is, is the recipient of the Distinguished Researcher Award from the Oncology Nurses Society and has been inducted into Sigma Theta Tau's International Research Hall of Fame. Please help me welcome Dr. Brunner as our Claire Fagan recipient for 2020. Deb. Hello. I'm hoping that you can see my screen. Yep, but not yet. Not yet? Uh, um, share. Let's see. How's that? Very good. Wonderful. Well, for all this awards, technology still... Uh, Befuddles me. <laughs> Thank you, um, Dr. Richmond. Thank you, Martha, who nominated me for this award. Um, thank you for all who are spending um, time listening to this. I greatly appreciate um, your attendance. I'm most appreciative of Claire Fagan, and I will um, say a few words um, about Claire in a few minutes, but I'm so honored to be among the Claire Fagan Award winners, very esteemed colleagues, um, giants in the field in their own right, and, and this is really an amazing um, uh, honor. Thank, so thank you all. I'd like to start by dedicating this talk 
to my family, especially my husband, who has um, been my friend, my husband, my love, um, father of my children, and um, my career coach. Uh, and without him, I certainly would not be here today. I'd also like to dedicate this talk to all the doctoral, pre-doc students, post-doc students, and junior faculty who have joined the uncertain career path of academia. And what I would like this talk to do, if nothing else, is for you, students and junior faculty, to realize that success is never a linear path. It's more like shoots and ladders. There are two steps forward, sometimes one, sometimes five steps back. And then someone, a good mentor, hopefully gives you a hand up and there could be 10 steps forward. So I want you to know you're not alone in the bumps and challenges, the ups and downs of a career path. I think that's in all careers, but I think there's something special about that in academia. So I'm going to talk about three areas, inspiration, innovation, and impact. I really could give the whole talk on inspiration and it's much more fun for me to talk about that than it is the other two. And Martha has uh, been so kind <laughs> as to talk about my uh, most of my career. So I'm not sure I'm gonna give you much more in innovation, um, but I really do wanna spend the time um, on those who have inspired my career path. And of course, then I have to start with my family. In the center is my immediate family. My husband to the left is Jesse. To the right are our son, David, and his wife, Christina. But throughout this um, journey, I feel like I've been so fortunate to have the support of friends and family that make the journey worth it. For all the bumps and ups and downs, if you don't have someone's shoulder to cry on, if you don't have someone to share the joy with like today, it's not worth it. So I have found that they give my purpose of work meaning. Um, sharing it with them has been everything and they inspire me every day. My husband had a, a long time career um, in a jewelry store with his brother who is there in the lower right hand corner in the center who um, very sadly has now passed. And then in his 50s decided he was gonna go back and get his law degree, which he did and passed the bar on the first try and opened a successful practice here in Atlanta. It shows that at any age we can change our stars and I'm so proud of him every day. My immigrant grandparents are up there in the left-hand corner from Italy. My grandfather, who was my rock in that middle picture on the left. My mother, who made me feel like I could do anything. Although she had a very pragmatic and realistic um, bent to her. I always knew I wanted science, but I thought I wanted archeology span or oceanography. And my mother was very practical to point out that I both sunburned and got seasick. So somehow my path ended up in nursing and yet nursing science became my passion and my love, but she always made me feel that there was nothing that I couldn't achieve. My aunt Lottie, who at an age when women were um, very dependent, was the most independent woman I ever knew and made me feel like I could travel the world and do every, anything. In the upper right hand quarter are my um, son Jesse, my husband and Jesse's partner Ben. They make me laugh. They make they made um, the pandemic something that I could live through because of the joy that they brought. There are my brothers there in the middle on the right who are poking, prodding, and uh, pinching me through this picture um, while we have silly looks on our face. But they make me laugh, give me joy, and support me all the way. And then in that bottom picture, um, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, who were Holocaust survivors, my brother-in-law, who was my husband's long-term partner in the jewelry business, have all passed, but have supported me throughout my entire career, and we miss them every day. Extended family gives us incredible joy. Again, purpose for working so hard. They are the reward, spending time with them, and I'm so grateful to have them. I have two brothers by birth, but in that lower um, left-hand corner picture, I have two sisters by choice. My two best friends, Sharon Francis and Dr. Susan Brown, who was the chief uh, nurse executive officer at City of Hope, 
who has joined us today. They have heard all of my woes. They laugh with me, they celebrate with me, and I am so grateful to have them. In the right hand lower box is Dr. Ann O'Mara, my longtime NIH program officer. Yes, you can become best friends with your NIH program officer. She is a tireless champion for nursing and has done more at the NIH for palliative care than anyone I know. And my other friend, Carol Ferens, we are there celebrating when they nominated me for fellowship in the Academy of Nursing. Thank you and thank you for joining us. In my professional career, there are so many that have inspired me and I cannot thank them all. I am sorry if I miss anyone, but there are a couple of highlights that I have to point out. I had a very twisted and turned um, path in my career and I used to chide myself for not having some well laid out plan. I thought that there was something wrong, that everyone that was successful had a career path and they knew exactly what they wanted to do at a young age and they made every step forward. And I took twists and turns all over the place. I took some time off, babies, I went, thought I knew what I wanted to do in my career, loved a job, never wanted to leave, and then something happened and I did. And I thought that there was some flaw in the lack of plan. But when I joined Penn, there was a, a event for Claire, as there are many, recognizing her fantastic career. And they had interviewed her in a video and what she said was, I think modeling my own career is not bad, but I think the best advice is don't plan your career. I don't have any goals for myself except to do what I'm doing very well. But I have tremendous goals for my school, my people, and my profession. I then was able to feel normal and stop chiding myself because if someone like Claire Fagan could be the Dean of the School of Medicine, I mean of Nursing at Penn, and then the first female president at the University of Pennsylvania, I knew I was in good stead. She made me feel that my path could still be successful while not having been well laid out. And I thank you, Claire. You have guided me every day since I heard that, and I have been so grateful. My primary mentor of my life has been Dr. Gerald Hanks, who has passed a few years ago. Um, he was the chairman of radiation therapy at Fox Chase Cancer Center. And while we use the word pioneer maybe too often in medicine, he was a true pioneer. In the 1960s, um, before that time, radiation oncologists were not trained as radiation oncologists, they were radiologists who did a specialty in radiation. But as radiation became a mainstay of cancer therapy, the uh, field of medicine realized this was a subspecialty unto itself, needed training unto itself, and he was in the very first class ever to be trained out of medical school as a radiation oncologist, but that wasn't enough. He then pioneered what was called conformal therapy. What it was is more precision radiation therapy because the old way had us radiating front, back, side to side through normal tissue and leaving patients with terrible side effects. He was a pioneer and changed for field technique to conformal therapy. That wasn't enough. He led the something called the National Patterns of Care Study which looked at how radiation was being used and what the outcomes were. That changed quality assurance and radiation therapy throughout the entire United States and the world. He was a true pioneer. But what more than that he was, was the most amazing mentor. He not only gave advice, he gave me opportunity to take advantage of every opportunity. If I needed to fly somewhere, if I needed time off, if I needed support while I went back to school for my PhD, he was there, he listened, and if I am one-tenth the mentor Dr. Hanks was, I will consider myself very fortunate. He also mentored someone else you may recognize, Dr. Alex Hanlon. We were there at Fox Chase together early on in our careers. He became not only my friend, but my lifelong partner and statistician, and we are both most grateful for Dr. Hanks. When I decided I wanted to get a PhD, the place I wanted to come was the University of Pennsylvania. I was beginning to look for evidence in symptom management and, um, in general, 
and in sexual uh, symptom management and sexual function. And who were the two leading nurses in the United States, if not the world, in these areas? Dr. Roz Watts was doing work in sexual function. I wanted to work with Roz and Ruth McCorkle, who passed um, a little over a year ago, was my dissertation chair. She is, without a doubt, the grand dom of symptom science in oncology. She was a tireless advocate for patients and for nursing, a superstar, still widely cited today, and led the way for many of us. And I am the most fortunate of women to have had these two phenomena on my dissertation committee. When the time came, um, I, after I finished my PhD, I was working at Fox Chase. I loved my job at Fox Chase. I never wanted to leave there. But Roz called and said that Ruth had gone to Yale and they were looking for a senior um, faculty member in oncology. I did not want to leave Fox Chase, but my career coach, my husband, told me this was a good opportunity and I should do it. And I wanted to be respectful of Roz, of course, so she asked me to interview. I thought I would be polite, make Roz and my husband happy. I would go, I would interview, and then I would tell both of them that it didn't work out. I'm staying at Fox Chase where I loved. Then I met this force of nature, this amazing woman to whom you cannot say no. I met Dr. Afaf Felice, who was then the Dean of Nursing um, at, um, uh, at the School of Nursing at Penn. I was sure that I was going to go in there, um, tell her all the reasons why I couldn't come, and I would leave. Well, I walked out having applied for the position at the University of Pennsylvania, and the rest was history. It was the best career move, one of the best career moves in my entire life. But not only was Afaf my dean, she became my mentor. It was amazing to watch her interact with her peers across the university and has become a lifelong personal friend and someone I still call for advice. It was my honor to work with all three of these women and they have shaped my career more than I can ever say. While I was in doctoral school, I had two young children, my husband worked six days a week and I had a full-time job. So of course, like many doctoral students, I ran myself into the ground. I ended up in the emergency room with my asthma every year for the three years I was in coursework. And it was my colleague who has become my lifelong friend, who was a superstar in her own right, Dr. Mary Cooley, who used to literally transcribe her notes into my notebook when I was in the emergency room. I never would have gotten through doctoral school without Dr. Mary Cooley, who is now at the Harvard Joint Centers. You all know Dr. Uh, Martha Curley. She nominated me for this award she gave a beautiful introduction, but she is a monumental superstar in the world of pediatric nursing. Um, her, she has led multiple um, teams, multidisciplinary, leads physicians in changing um, pediatric uh, nursing clinical practice and practice for physicians as well. What you don't know is that Mary's career and mine were very, Martha's career and mine were very similar. She got a PhD, but started her academic career in a health system, leading research there. I did the same thing after a PhD. I was at Fox Chase. Um, I went to Albert Einstein, et cetera. So um, Martha and I, when we came into academia, we became academic soul sisters at Penn. And after every faculty meeting, we went out for dinner and drinks. Martha is an incredible role model, a fantastic scientist, a tremendous academic, a teacher, mentor, and a good, long, personal friend. Thank you, Martha. I have many mentor, many mentees that I wish I could recognize them all because they inspire me every day. I learn more from them, I am sure, than they learn from me. I'm going to point out three who have been at Penn. Dr. Sunwa Shao was my pre-doc who came from China, had a basic fundamental understanding of English, but truly learned English as she was getting a PhD. I certainly could not go to China, learn Chinese, and get a PhD in Chinese um, at the same time. I admire her work. She's a superstar. She got a K99 award, which is very competitive, and got her first R01 before she ever completed her K99. 
She has had multiple accolades. She came to Emory with me as a postdoc and is on faculty at Emory. Dr. June Mao is a physician who um, does tremendous work in um, integrative oncology. He is the president of the Society of Integrative Oncology and is now Memorial Sloan Kettering leading their service there. And we still co continue to collaborate. And my good friend, um, Dr. Salima Magani, who had gotten a stellar R01, I mean, K01 award that was rolled into an AARRA challenge grant. We were so proud of that. She's done tremendous work in palliative care. We continue to collaborate with her at Emory, and all of them inspire me in their work every single day. While I was at Penn, um, I had tremendous research teams. I want to point someone else out here. Her name is Suzanne Limecooler. She's an administrative assistant, still at Penn. I miss her every day. It shows that how your support makes you successful. Um, Suzanne was not just an administrative assistant. She's a friend, but she supported the entire team. She believed in the mission of our research. And without her coordination, she was the glue that kept us all together. I just want to say how important every role is on the team that um, supports you in your research. But the purpose of all that I do is the, are the patients themselves. I think they're the purpose of all of those in nursing and medicine. They're the reason we get up in the morning, and they're the reason that we go into research. It's when we fail to help our patients, particularly in cancer, when we don't um, have the treatments that help them live and survive, when we do have treatments that leave them with terrible symptoms and side effects and a diminished quality of life, we feel driven to do better. And it's our patients that have driven me to the profession of nursing, into research where I want evidence every day to do better because we are not doing enough to save them and to save their quality of life. They inspire me, they are brave, and I thank them, particularly those who are willing to enroll on clinical trials. Before I move on to innovation, I also want to recognize Dean Burrell. I saw Tony first before she was the Dean of the School of Nursing um, at Penn, I heard her speak at the academy. I was so impressed of her career of her career trajectory, um, and was thrilled when she then became um, the dean um, of the School of Nursing here at Penn. Pony has contacted me through every award since Flowers. is a tremendous cheerleader for all those at Penn and all those alumni from Penn. And I wanna recognize her and I am so grateful for her friendship, her um, leadership at Penn every day. Thank you, Tony. So what do you do with all this inspiration? Well, if you're lucky, you get a chance to use it in some way. And I've tried to do that in my research and practice. Excuse me. Um, I don't really have time to go through each study and how I got where I was, so I'm going to start with one. And the point of this is to show you that there was not a well-planned path. What there was is I had a passion for finding better symptom management and quality of life for my patients, uh, global quality of life and sexual function, symptom management. And it starts with one thing frequently and snowballs into um, a lot of other work, depending on how much opportunity you take. We are all presented with opportunity. What we need to do is find our passion and really um, elaborate on that and take the opportunities that come. I have a general direction I knew I wanted to be in. I was in cancer. I knew I was interested in symptom management. I knew I was interested in giving patients a voice um, of their own experience so that we could do better in symptom management. I was observing that clinician reports um, were not all they should be. Clinicians had brief intercounters with patients and probably weren't picking up all of the things that we should be thinking about, especially in research. And so I became very interested in this topic. 
it's hard to believe, but in um, the 1980s, clinical trials groups were only studying mortality and morbidity that re were reported by physicians. So it was treatment A versus treatment B, did the patient live and longer on one treatment than the other, and what were the toxicities that the, pa that the physicians were reporting. Um, in the 19, late 1980s, the National Cancer Institute realized that that was not enough, that it wasn't enough to help patients survive cancer. We had to help patients have quality of life after cancer. So they had asked the uh, cooperative groups to begin to look at patient reported outcomes at the time. We just called it quality of life. Um, there came out a one-page request for quality of life studies. I walked into my office one day. I found a piece of paper on my desk from Dr. Hanks. And at the top of the paper from the NCI, it said Deb. And I knew exactly what that meant. So I took the paper into him and he said, I don't really know what this is, but I think that this is going to be really important and that you should do it. So I wrote the first quality of life study for um, the radiation therapy oncology group, clinical trials group, when I had a master's degree. I had not gotten a PhD yet. Mary McCabe, who is also a Penn alum, called me. She was a program officer at the NIH, and she said, Deb, you didn't really do a very good job with this, but we really want to get into quality of life in the cooperative groups. So we're going to let you do this study, but you're going to have to do better in the future. And I ended up enrolling in a doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania, and it started my research career, which took all kinds of twists and turns. Once you do something, they, uh, one study, people ask you to do lots of other things, and so I um, led the quality of life and outcome studies in the radiation therapy oncology group. I got involved in the gynecologic oncology group. But the body of work, by incorporating these measures into clinical trials, helped a paradigm shift from a physician-oriented survival model to incorporation of quality of life, economic endpoints, multiple other endpoints in clinical trials, a very holistic kind of approach. This led to um, my appointment in the National Cancer Institute as the inaugural co-chair of the Symptom Management Health-Related Quality of Life that, as Martha mentioned, um, uh, reviews all quality of life studies um, in the national cooperative groups. This led to lots of other things. I was asked to sit on a panel for how we report qu um, quality of life and patient reported outcomes. And there's a consort model that is now published in how to do that. From um, my co-chairing the symptom management committee, we led um, a national um, uh, symposium on identifying quality of life that should be measured in all cancer patients. This also led to um, my invitation to be a co-investigator on a study that is changing the paradigm for measurement in quality of life. And it's something called the patient reported outcomes version of the CTCAE, which is a toxicity measure that physicians report. So now we have a patient reported um, uh, measure that goes with that so that we can really understand the patient experience and give them voice in clinical trials and clinical outcomes. This has led to publications um, uh, other publications in um, patient reported outcomes. Um, but I, what I think is more important is what I call the alt metrics of uh, grants and publications and lectures. It's when nurses start to tell you that they're incorporating your work into, into their practice. It's when things get into clinical practice guidelines. And I recently received um, an email from a nurse at Varian who um, they develop radiation therapy machines and um, software. Um, and they're citing my work now as um, um, some of the foundation for incorporating patient reported outcomes in their medical affairs solutions. Um, this is what um, is important for impact in getting it into electronic medical records and into practice. Um, I've had a similar um, uh, path in sexual function where we started out um, measuring vaginal length. Um, that may sound like an odd thing, but in uh, GYN cancers, we give radiation therapy and we're literally, literally able to close off a woman's vagina. So one day I went down to the machine shop with a um, vaginal uh, dilator and I asked them to shave it and calibrate it. 
And you can imagine in the machine shop the conversation about <laughs> developing this instrument. But we did go on and we validated this in the gynecologic oncology group. We used it in funded studies to measure vaginal length and compliance. This led to um, invitations on work on the late effects of radiation therapy, and it helped us incorporate measures of sexual function and quality of life into many physician-reported outcomes. We then took this work into prospective clinical trials, and we did two trials in um, sexual function in men treated for prostate cancer. And when you start to do this kind of work and you publish, people reach out to you for mentorship and dissertation committees and leads to all kinds of other opportunities. Um, again, the one in yellow over on the far right is one of the things that I'm more, most proud of. A nurse came to me and said that she read my work and listened to the lectures and incorporated um, this and started a sexual health follow-up clinic at the University of Utah. This more than anything makes me feel that I do have a purpose. Somebody actually reads what you write because you wonder that sometimes when you publish and it's making a difference in patients' lives. Our current work is in a hot new area of research called the microbiome. It's what looks at all the bugs that live within us and on us. And we find that there is a commensal relationship between uh, microbes and the human body. Um, and we're also finding that there's a relationship with cancer. It turns out that some good um, microbes, some of these bugs may actually help prevent cancer like HPV um, in cervical cancer. But if you have a bad community of microbes, they're pathogenic and they may actually promote cancer. Um, our group is the first group research group ever to start to look at the associations between these, micro, these microbial communities and not just cancer itself, but the symptoms we are left with. Over on the left, you can see the red is cancer patients and the green are healthy controls. And you start to see a different pattern of microbial communities between cancer and healthy. That box at the top right is pre-treatment, pre-chemo radiation, and the blue box is post. Again, you start to see a different pattern in microbes. And what we're learning is this is a heat map where we start to look at microbial communities. We are seeing uh, a difference between healthy and normal, but for the first time ever, our research group has begun to report that there is an association with specific microbial taxa and post-treatment symptoms, including vaginal pain and vaginal dryness. We have a lot more work to do in this area, but it's very, very exciting. I want to put in a shameless plug for the fact that we have a postdoctoral position open at Emory, and we're happy for anyone uh, interested who would like to apply. So it's great to do all this work, but what does it mean? And it means not a lot of anything unless it has impact on patients' lives. So I'm going to talk about two examples of how some of our work has been included both in clinical practice guidelines but that's still not enough. What we need to know is that those clinical practice guidelines is actually changing practice and helping patients. The first study I'm gonna mention, Martha um, had uh, said a few words about, is our work in um, radiation therapy and bone metastasis from cancer. So you know that cancer frequently metastasizes. It's exceedingly painful when it goes to bone and radiation therapy is a good treatment. But for years, um, patients with bone metastasis have been treated with many, many fractions. They'd have to come in 20, sometimes 30 times to get radiation to their painful bone mets. There had been some trials in Europe and Canada that was starting to show that one single fraction of radiation therapy delivered the same pain control as 10, 20, or 30 fractions. Now, making a poor patient with metastatic disease come in and out of the hospital 30 times when they might get the same relief with one single um, treatment um, is an obvious um, area that we should look into. 
But the trials that showed that one fraction was equivalent to more fractions in Europe and right in um, Canada, the primary outcome had been clinician physician reports of pain control. And there was a lot of um, pushback and criticism that maybe what we needed to do is have patient reports of their own pain as the field was moving forward where we recognized that only patients are the um, credible reporter of their own pain. Pain does not have a blood test. Pain does not have an x-ray. There is new, no quantifiable way to, for a physician or a nurse practitioner to measure pain. The only person who understands their own pain is the patient. And so we designed the first trial that incorporated um, a randomization between one single fraction of radiation to compared to 10 fractions of radiation. My colleague, Dr. William Hartzell, was the principal investigator who designed the radiation therapy in this, and I was the investigator who designed the primary outcome using a patient-reported measure called the Brief Pain Index. And we looked at equivalency between these two fractionation schemes at three months. And what we found is indeed, there was no difference in patient reported pain, whether a complete response, partial, stable, or progressive pain, there was no difference between one fraction and longer fractions. We were able to show that um, we got the same response with eight gray as we did with 30 gray. One thing um, did show up is that um, there was less physician reported toxicity on a single gray, which was good news, but there was a slightly higher retreatment rate with radiation if you had one fraction. But what did that really mean? It didn't mean that recurrence of pain was different whether you had one fraction or 10 fractions. It meant that once pain recurred, if you only had one fraction, the doctor was likely to give you more radiation, because if you had 30, we start to worry about normal tissue toxicity. So if you had one fraction, you got more fraction when you recurred. If you had um, 10 fractions, then they were likely to give you more pain medication. So it was not an excuse not to treat with a single fraction. Again, we showed similar quality of life, global quality of life and pain outcomes on this trial. So now we were able to conclude that radiation is effective, whether you got one or more, so it makes sense to use a single fraction. Um, we did an economic analysis, and yes, of course, one fraction is cost-effective. So, um, then we did multiple publications, and this work um, worked its way into clinical practice guidelines, which is a great thing. You are happy when your work um, is cited in clinical practice guidelines. Um, it, your work is not cited unless it's on the back of giants and other studies. This was not the first study of its kind. This was the definitive study, and based on this, we've changed practice guidelines not just in the United States, but also in the UK, in Germany, and our work is cited by the World Health Organization. Okay, well, that's all well and good. We can all work around proud that we had great publications, and yes, the work is cited in clinical practice guidelines. Are we helping patients? Not enough to be cited in clinical practice guidelines. What we've got to know is if clinicians are using this advice if they are now treating with a single fraction, if they're making patients not schlep in for 10, 20, or 30 treatments, are they using one fraction? Well, a recent study has found that around the world, we have started to change practice and up to 75% of practices are using a single fraction radiation. But the rate is lower in the United States than it is in Europe and Canada. Why is that? Well, we have a monumental disincentive in our health reimbursement. We pay by the fraction. So if you get more money for 10 fractions, 
than you do for one fraction, unfortunately, the US practice is still using multiple fractions. This is of such concern, it has worked its way into a national campaign by um, medical associations. You may have heard of this, it's called Choosing Wisely, where medical associations have asked their subspecialties to identify areas where we're doing things in practice that are not evidence-based or not cost-effective. The Choosing Wisely campaign is something where we're telling practitioners to stop doing things that you shouldn't be doing. And in radiation, one of the Choosing Wisely initiatives is around this. We are telling clinicians to stop using multiple fractions when they should use one single fraction with eight gray. This now is working its way into cancer care delivery studies in trying to improve U.S. physicians' use of a single gray. One study recently, um, one of the first to try to um, put pop-ups in the electronic medical record to make the clinicians do the right thing, did not see much of a difference, but they think they've learned a great deal through that first study. And there are now more cancer care delivery studies under underway trying to help clinicians to choose wisely and treat patients with one single fraction of radiation therapy. Another example is a study also in radiation therapy where we're trying to do less, not more. We took a study and compared something called hypofractionated radiation therapy, which is less radiation therapy, compared to conventional radiation therapy, which is more radiation therapy, for patients with low risk prostate cancer. And I'm gonna show you where the patient reported outcome has actually been the tipping point in these studies. So again, like the BOMET study, there had been some other European work that had showed that hypofractionation is effective and equivalent to longer courses. So if this study was positive, we would be able to pay, um, treat patients um, under six weeks with radiation therapy instead of over eight weeks. So again, they'd have to come in every day, five days a week for eight weeks to get their prostate, low risk prostate cancer treated, versus this new hypofractionated radiation therapy. And what we did is um, looked at um, both the uh, progression-free survival and uh, quality of life on these studies. And it was found that um, in terms of progression-free survival, the primary outcome, that there was no difference. It was equivalent. But physicians, reported, this is a physician report, not patient report, physicians reported a little bit of a difference in low grade, mild, not high grade, mild bowel and bladder changes. The clinicians were saying there was a statistically significant change and that hypofractionated fr fractionation, the less treatment might be causing mild symptoms in the patient. Um, I led the patient reported outcome version of this study, and we looked not just at statistical significance, but clinical significance, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. So what we saw for bowel is that the patients themselves reported no difference whether they were on conventional therapy or hypofractionated therapy at baseline and at six months. At 12 months, we saw a very small but statistically significant difference in patient-reported bowel function. But we did not see a clinical significant difference. What does that mean? Well, if you have a scale on 100 points of bowel, zero means you have no bowel problems, and 100 means you have the worst possible bowel problems in the whole world. And you have a whole lot of patients that answer this. And a lot of patients show that they went from zero to maybe a three-point change on a 100-point scale. Well, if you have a whole lot of patients that went from zero to three, you can say, yes, we saw a statistically different 
outcome um, on the hypofractionated arm. But did that mean anything to the patient? Was the patient able to say that, yes, I saw a difference, I had more diarrhea or less diarrhea on one arm versus the other? And that's what a clinically significant difference is. And indeed, on a 100-point scale, three-point change meant nothing to the patients. They could not tell one darn bit of difference um, in their bowel function if they moved three points. Now, if they moved 10 points, they could see a difference. In this trial, there was no difference by the shorter, between the shorter radiation treatments and the longer. And we saw the same thing for urinary, hormonal, and sexual functions. The patients could not tell any difference between the two treatment arms. So then, of course, the shorter one is more convenient for patients and it's cheaper. Well, this has not been published as long as the BOMET study, but it's already working its way through clinical practice guidelines. Um, it's now being cited by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network in their guidelines for prostate cancer. It's being reported in um, the United Kingdom in their guidelines. And um, the quality of life is also working its way through and has been reported by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. Now, remember, it was the quality of life portion of this study that really helped us understand the benefit because if we only looked at progression-free survival and the physician report, we might have been concerned that there might have been a little bit of difference in toxicity, but it turns out there was no difference from the patient perspective, and they're the ones, believe it or not, who actually count. It is their voice that is critical. It's their voice we need to listen to. And this is now changing practice. We're moving towards hypofractionated radiation therapy for men with low risk prostate cancer. There's lots of other ways to have impact between, besides grants and pubs and pubs and grants. Although when any junior faculty asks me, um, what is the criteria for promotion? I tell them the same things. It's pubs and grants and grants and pubs. However, we do expect service. There's teaching and there's um, service to our institution and to our profession. I know that many people are involved in many different organizations as I was, but I really recommend that you find your favorite and you really spend a lot of your volunteer time in an area where you think you're making a change. And for me, it's been the Oncology Nursing Society. I joined as a member back in 1984. You don't rise through the ranks without putting in your time. You put in your time as a member, and then you put in your time as a volunteer. So early on, I was the program chair for the local chapter um, and went to um, the meetings, the national meetings. Right there is my dear friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Susan Brown, who is with us today. We have a great story about um, going to Congress together because um, my husband and I um, actually had two weddings. We um, were adopting a child, so we got married quickly and had a big wedding planned and still had the big wedding. Um, we thought we were going to get adopt after the wedding, but the adoption was coming through early. So they told us we had to run out and get married. So we ran down to Maryland and we got married. Um, and the day after we got married, I left my husband and went with Sue Brown, um, who to this day says, I spent my honeymoon with my best friend. Um, and we went to the Oncology Nursing Society. And every year when we went, my husband would say, sure, leave me, you left me on our honeymoon. Um, but the truth be told, when we got married in September, uh, we had a very big um, honeymoon, and uh, we went to um, Italy and France, um, but it's a great story to tell. And I did spend the day after my first marriage to my husband um, with Sue Brown at the Oncology Nursing Society. Um, then for years, um, there were lots of other things I volunteered for, whether it was working groups um, or um, I did um, a lot with um, um, uh, education. 
we actually, um, I was the editor-in-chief for um, the Oncology Nursing Society very first manual ever for radiation therapy at the time in 1992. There were tons of publications for chemotherapy nurses, but there was nothing for radiation therapy nurses. So um, we pro put a proposal into the Oncology Nursing Society, and here's the team that worked together to come up with the manual. It's now in its fifth edition, and I was the editor-in-chief for the first three and continued to write for that manual. I'm very proud of that, bringing radiation therapy um, into the fold of having great guidelines for practice and education. And through the years, I've served on their research committees and advisory panels, et cetera. And if you live long enough and volunteer long enough, then you have opportunities to be invited um, to give keynote addresses. And I was fortunate, uh, Dr. Sue Brown nominated me in 2015 for the Distinguished Research Award, and there's my husband and I. And all of my friends and supporters were there then as they are here today, and I thank them all for the time they spend listening to me, um, and I hope I'm not boring them too much with a repeat. Um, the latest reward we've gotten um, is this year, my um, mentee uh, junior faculty at, the, uh, at Emory University, Dr. Jin Bing Bai, is a tremendous inspiration to me, is doing amazing work in the microbiome, will outshine me by far in this field, and has taught himself the bioinformatics necessary to do this um, very complex work. So more inspiration you find along the way as you give service. You get more back, I think, than you ever give. But in addition to my professional society, there were lots of opportunities to volunteer, and I've been a long time volunteer for the American Cancer Society, which again, after time, I um, was elected to the board of directors. And I've volunteered um, for the National Cancer Institute, multiple um, advisory panels there. Again, I get back much more than I learn. As um, a, a reviewer on grants, you learn so much how to write a good grant when you're on an NCI or an NIH um, grant um, opportunity. You get to network with the most amazing people when you volunteer for these committees, and I highly recommend it. Um, in as um, <laughs> as Martha pointed out, um, I was appointed. Um, there are only two um, National Cancer uh, Advisory Boards or NIH Advisory Boards that are presidential appointees, and the National Cancer Advisory Board is one of them. And it has been my honor to serve um, on this advisory board. Um, I did volunteer work for the National Academy of Medicine. All I owe um, in the National Academy is to my current dean, um, uh, Dr. Linda McCauley, who was the associate dean for research at Penn. Um, I warn all of you who know Dr. McCauley never to go out with her for a martini. Um, as she was leaving Penn, I took her for a martini and congratulations of her new appointment as dean at Emory. Um, I walked out of that meeting as the interim associate dean for research at Penn was not my intention, um, but she, like Dr. F. F. Malise, maybe it's a, it's a quality of all deans that somehow you cannot say no to them. So um, Dr. McCauley has got me involved in the National Academy of Medicine and then nominated me, and I am so grateful to her. Um, it's quite an honor to serve. Um, I show you these flowers because these are from your dean, um, Tony Virel. Um, as I mentioned, Tony has been one of my major supporters, and I am so thankful for her continued um, inclusion of me in the Penn family. Um, this has led to um, authorship. They used to be called the IOM reports, and I think many of you may be um, familiar with them. We came out with one this year on diagnosing and treating adult cancers um, and associated impairments. Um, these are uh, really incredible reports. You get to work with people across all different disciplines that you would never meet normally, um, but are leaders in their field. Um, and these reports do change policy and practice. Um, we'll be coming out with one this year on radioactive sources, um, looking at uh, the dangers and benefits of a radiation, um, not just in um, medical practice, but in well logging and research, et cetera, um, across the globe. And we're making some um, recommendations there. 
Um, I also have had the tremendous opportunity to have global engagement, and this is one of um, the absolute joys of my um, and honors of, of my career. Um, Emory has um, a program with um, Addis Ababa University. Emory Nursing has helped the University of Addis Ababa start their very first PhD program. Um, Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries in the world, um, and I am inspired every day by, by the most intelligent, engaged, incredible healthcare um, providers and nurses in the world who overcome tremendous lack of resources and odds every day to give exemplary care. Um, this is with um, our doctoral student, Samira Lemon, um, who is working in cervical cancer and will be getting a PhD soon um, from um, Addis Ababa University in collaboration with Emory University. So where does all this go? Um, well, um, I've been fortunate um, to have sustained funding um, since 1998, um, yes, and we've had a high level of funding. Um, most of that is certainly due to my being the PI of a national cooperative group, um, which is an honor um, as a researcher and certainly as a nurse. Um, a, lot, a lot of nurses are not involved in the national cooperative groups, although I have worked very hard to be inclusive of nursing and have nursing leaders now on every major committee within our um, cancer program in the National Cooperative Group in Energy Oncology. Um, Mary Cooley, Deb Barton, um, Kate Yeager, uh, Sun Wa Shao is involved, um, met my mentees, um, Jim Bing Bai, um, uh, Ron Etheridge, uh, Eldridge, who is an epidemiologist. So it's a great opportunity to mentor um, great faculty. I highly recommend it. It really brings your work to a new level and impact when you get involved in national studies. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, there's nothing easy about it, but then I never really want it easy. I, I really love and appreciate things that challenge me every day, which is one of the reasons why I so loved um, getting a PhD at Penn. Um, I went to an okay undergrad, I went to a good master's program, but when I wanted to get my PhD, I wanted it to hurt my brain. I wanted to be challenged and I wanted a level of discourse that I wouldn't get anywhere else. I also was so proud to be part of a group of not just PhD nurses who are awesome and fabulous, but a really select group of PhD nurses who are well-funded and do research. And that's what the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania are. Um, so those of you who are in the doctoral program and you feel like it's a struggle and you question some days while you're there, um, I encourage you to be nothing but proud and stick with it because it will bring your research to a level that few programs do. In the United States, we don't advertise this, but while there are um, many doctoral programs in nursing, there are only a thimbleful where the nurses are so well-trained in their PhDs that they are leaders in research and are well-funded. And you at Penn are among those elite, uh, elite few. So absorb it, let it challenge you every day, but it will be worth every minute of it when you come out. I would not be the researcher I was today, I am today, if not for all those who inspired me, mentored me, taught me, and supported me. And I am so proud to be part of the Penn family. But I want to say something to the junior faculty. Yep, this was a great story you just heard. Most of it was, all of the ups. And while there were twists and turns that I did not plan, what you didn't really hear were all the downs and all the failures. Let me assure you, there were many. In fact, sometimes I think I might have had more failures than many of you in the audience. For every award, there is a plethora of awards, proposals, and manuscripts that were soundly rejected. 
So what do you do? Well, I was telling the students today when I talked to them, you wallow in self-pity for about 24 hours. You wallow so much you get all pruny in self-pity. And then after a couple of glasses of wine and crying on your husband's shoulder and your good friend's shoulders, Sue and Sharon probably should have every one of these awards with me, given all that they put up with, you get back on the horse. You reread the rejection, which you absolutely hated the first time you read it. Every comment you say is stupid and they didn't understand you and they had the wrong reviewers or you had the wrong uh, uh, faculty that were looking at your work. The editors didn't know what they were talking about. They weren't in your science. And you reread the critique again. And when you're done, you say, wait, you know, maybe that was a good point. Or, oh, yeah, I got it. I probably could have said that better. Now, some of the comments you do find are sometimes <laughs> you feel like they're stupid. Um, but most of the time, what you do get is a very good critique. You cannot be successful in academia without learning from your failures. You cannot be successful without learning from your mistakes and doing better the next time. And the next time is not just the time after you failed. There could be multiple failures in a row. Expect that. Now, in the National Cancer Institute, it's much easier to get funded as a uh, new investigator than it is as a senior investigator. The pay line in the National Cancer Institute for funded studies is 8%. That means 92% of everything that gets submitted gets rejected. So you can imagine there's a lot of good work that gets rejected. Well, when the NIH work gets rejected, it, we find other outlets. We've gone to the Oncology Nursing Society, we've gone to foundations, but we don't give up. We learn from our mistakes, we take every critique seriously, we get back on the horse, and we do it again. I can't say it's easy though, because this is me, yes, sad and sorry, feeling bad for myself every single time I get one of these rejections. And even as a senior researcher, I still get them probably at the rate you do. We put in one grant four times and were rejected four times before we then went to a foundation for funding. Um, so many of the grants are submitted multiple, multiple times, maybe f more than four times because we had to submit it to foundations. Um, and we did that a couple of times, but now we're well on our way with some of the research that we're doing in the microbiome. Um, and we'll, we will continue to submit R01s and other opportunities because the work that we're putting out is some of the first of its kind and we're doing really well in publications and we look forward to continuing the science. It doesn't mean those early rejections were wrong. We had a lot to learn. This was a new science for me, a new area. Um, so I had to take it um, very seriously. But I know that every day, you get a paperback that you might not have gotten the grade on that you wanted. You get a rejection from a grant. You get a rejection from um, uh, an editor. Please know it's part of academia. And what doesn't kill you really does make you stronger. There were lots of failures along the way. I am there with you. Please stick with it. Learn from your mistakes. Read the critiques seriously. And really realize it's not about you personally. All of this, the people that spend time critiquing your work, they volunteer for journals. Um, we volunteer for study sections. We really are trying to help and make it better. And while it doesn't always feel that way, and you're a sad sack when you see the critiques, it is the way of academia. And it is the way of success. So stick with it and you will get through it. And you will do better next time. And in the end, the most important part is you're going to help change practice, provide evidence-based practice, and you're going to help patients. That is our purpose. That is our purpose-driven life. That is our goal. And 
all the rest, the funding, the publications, it's all intermediate. Even getting your work in clinical practice guidelines, it means nothing unless people are using your work to do better, to make patients feel better, live longer, have better quality of life. So I congratulate all of you who have joined us in this uncertain journey full of pitfalls and failures, but also successes and purpose that make patients feel better. So I want to leave you with a quote. I found this from Ratan Tata, who is an Indian um, entrepreneur. He um, it leads Tata Motors. And he said, the ups and downs in life are very important to keep us going because a straight line, even in an ECG, means we are not alive. So when you think you would love this great stellar trajectory, that's actually flatlining. It's the pitfalls that give us color, stories to tell, things to share with our friends, and ways to grow and be better. Thank you all. I so appreciate your time. You could have done anything on this lovely afternoon, and I appreciate that you stopped. And I, again, thank my family, my friends, all of my mentors, and uh, Claire Fagan, and all previous Fagan Award winners who I'm honored to be among. Thank you. Deb, uh, all I can say is, wow, wow. Uh, your, your presentation was so inspiring, and there's so many nuggets that I took away and that I know many of our faculty are, are taking away. I think the most important one for me was um, being centered on why we do this work, and that is to improve the lives and to have an impact on, on our patients, whether it's through the research that we're doing, for keeping our focus in research as you did on patient reported outcomes by making sure that um, our, uh, as you said, it's not just about publications and grants, it's about what we do with it and how we enter that into practice. You've demonstrated your leadership in uh, running interdisciplinary teams in the persistence that you had in following uh, your passion in terms of how to move your science forward, and all of that is so inspiring. Um, I love your analogies of the shoots and ladders, and I love the analogy about the ECG, and I'll remember that for a long time. I know um, there's many, I would love to know, here from our, uh, in the chat, what inspired um, our audience about what you said. I know uh, when I heard you talking about the microbiome um, that our nutrition faculty are going crazy. I know they're inspired by that by that work, and I bet we'll look at ways to uh, to uh, work with you. Um, I know Deb from your presentation and work beyond that countless cancer patients have been impacted by your groundbreaking and interdisciplinary science, and you have ensured that trajectory will keep on um, because of the mentorship of your students and the young faculty and everyone you interact with. And that's made such a difference, not only in the field of nursing, but again, it demonstrates the leadership that nurses have in advancing science and moving patient care forward. So again, we are all so inspired and we are so proud of you. And we are so proud that you recognize Penn as foundational to the work and I know that your mentors um, uh, are looking down on you, and I can't wait to share this with Roz. I know she will be thrilled um, to, again, hear where some of her, her work and her mentorship went. So um, we're just so proud of you. Um, so in recognition of your extraordinary contributions that carry on Dr. Fagan's legacy, it's my great pleasure to bestow the Claire M. Fagan Distinguished Lecturer Award and you are right, you are joining a group of distinguished fellows here, um, alums, and also our faculty here. I know uh, I've seen in your, you can uh, see in the background the, uh, the uh, things that we shipped, shipped to, uh, to Deb in advance. Of course, flowers, but our certificate, and importantly, the, the time clock that, again, talks about your contributions being endless. So, again, 
Um, Deb, thank you for the generosity of your time for this, this absolutely inspirational talk. We're so proud of you today. And I wanna thank everyone for being here with us today and for this awards presentation to honor Deb, Dr. Deborah Watkins Bruner. I would like all of you now to uh, join us on our PhD Research Day event that follows. Um, I think our colleagues have put a link in the chat um, for you again to support our colleagues as they, as they move forward here. I also want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge some of those that are here with us today. So last night, we had a get together with our emeritus faculty, including all of our Penn's previous deans. They are and continue to be inspiring. Many of our emeritus faculty are here with us today, and again, always, always happy to have you with us. It's safe to say that our school would not enjoy its well-deserved reputation without the efforts and contributions of these individuals. The significant legacy left by these individuals has laid the groundwork for everything our school has come to be, and it is at the root of our consistently high impact around the world. I want to give a special thanks to um, Emeritus Dean Dr. Afaf Malis, who is with us today. She left her mark on Penn Nursing in so many ways around our school, but especially in today's event. Afaf established, established this lecture in Claire's name in 2003, and I can't think of a better tribute to Claire, while at the same time creating opportunities to highlight the extraordinary research contributions and innovations of our faculty and alums. So thank you, Afaf. And to our dear Claire, you're so loved in this school and this university, and I'm so honored to continue your incredible legacy at the school. We so appreciate your continued support and generosity and love that you give so freely to all of us. So thank you again to all of you for being with us today to celebrate Dr. Deborah Watkins Bruner. I hope to see you all at the PhD research event. And again, many thanks for being with us today.